I have the great pleasure to introduce Professor Harvey Friedman. Uh, probably I don't have to introduce him, but still, so please. <laughs> I'm very glad to be here. Um, I wish Anton Zeilinger's roof good luck. Unfortunately, I was very looking, much looking forward to him preceding me, but uh, it's not going to come to pass. So um, I'm talking about uh, past, present, and future directions in the foundations of mathematics. And if you see some elementary things that are routinely taught, that may be part of the past, of the past component, um, which will be uh, in force. Um, so, and if you um, are willing to wait to the end of the talk, there'll be something, of, uh, some interesting announcement. Um, Okay, so let me start. I'm going to pull out my clock. Okay. So we're going to talk about these topics. Uh, the foundational life, profound uneasiness, not in me, but the, 1800, the year 1800 mathematicians, profound uneasiness. Grand unification later, uh, culminating in ZFC axioms. Uh, we'll talk about assertions and proofs. We'll talk about three fundamental foundational moves, consistency, completeness, and incompleteness. And then we'll talk about each one of the three uh, uh, past, present, and future, each one of the three. All right. Foundational life. Kurt Gödel is the great practitioner of the foundational life who has had such a profound influence on me and so many others. In the foundational life, there are two principal goals. First of all, the founding of new systematic disciplines that have the same general features as the great systematic disciplines that have emerged over the centuries, such as mathematics, physics, statistics, computer science, electrical engineering, etc doesn't happen too often, and more often happens in smaller doses than that. But nevertheless, that's the big, uh, big goal. Uh, the redevelopment, reorganization, and imaginative exposition of existing systematic disciplines in the direction of creating deeper relevance to the original purposes for which they were founded. Uh, this is, of course, the more normal uh, expectation. Uh, and I'm going to contrast the foundational life, so this will become a little clearer what I have in mind. I'm going to contrast it with a couple of other lives we're all familiar with, the mathematical life and the philosophical life. By the way, I'm uh, thinking of um, talking about the foundational life in some form as a preamble to every talk I give from now on anywhere because um, uh, the foundational life is um, misunderstood and insufficiently supported. So, and in other words, it can be confused with philosophy and it can be confused with math and um, this creates uh, misunderstandings. So I think this is something that I need to uh, say more often. So in the foundational life, philosophy is commonly used as a method, method for choosing and analyzing fundamental concepts, and mathematics is commonly used for rigorous development. The mathematics informs the philosophy, and the philosophy informs the mathematics. Now in the foundational life, there is a delicate balance between the philosophical and the mathematical, both subservient to the principal focus in items one and two. In the foundational life, no premium whatsoever is paid, per se, to careful philosophical statements and arguments, and no premium is paid, per se, to complicated and deep mathematical developments. However, careful philosophy and deep mathematics are used 
if they facilitate the main focus, one and two, and they often do, but per se it has no particular value um, in and of itself. These are simply tools doing philosophy. And it doesn't make any difference if the philosophy is done badly, as long as the foundations is done well. Of course, if the philosophy is done badly, that makes it somewhat less likely the foundations will be done well. All right. The foundational life as I practice it, okay, in the foundational life, there is constant assessment of the prospects for developing new systematic disciplines or redevelopment of existing systematic disciplines. Generally, this requires that there be a wide range of deep phenomena available for analysis. So, for example, if you wish to do the foundations of how many angels dance on a head of a pin, the trouble is there aren't a lot of existing data and experts on how many angels that dance on a head of a pin. So if you pick concepts that are not sufficiently fundamental, uh, then this is not going to amount to anything in terms of the foundational life. Uh, the foundational life as I practice it is both highly mathematical and highly philosophical, but it differs profoundly from the mathematical life and the philosophical life in various ways. In the philosophical life, there is a focus on careful analysis. Oh, but, but I should say that this whole thing I'm doing here with foundational life is a piece of philosophy, which, which my only value is to help clarify foundational life, and the philosophy may be actually quite bad by philosophy standards, it doesn't make a difference to me. Okay, but, so, but, it, it, but it appears to be the right kind of philosophy for formulating what foundational life is. So, if people uh, uh, go away from this talk and say, oh, the philosophy was really bad, but the, you know, but the foundations was good, that would be a compliment. Okay, so in the philosophical life, there's a focus on careful analysis. This is the philosophical life now. There's a careful analysis of apparently fundamental concepts and making careful arguments that can be defended against attacks, as well as attacking other people's careful arguments. Now, I underlined apparently because it's very easy in philosophy to find many, many examples of a preoccupation with clarification of notions that have no chance whatsoever of playing any serious role in the foundational life. So that's why I underline apparently. But sometimes that's not the case. Uh, and the, the last paragraph of this slide talks about the, a, a big, you know, the, the obvious exception, the obvious exception everybody knows. Now, in the philosophical life, the choice of these apparently fundamental concepts is not generally measured in terms of their appropriateness for the creation of new systematic disciplines that have the same general features as the great systematic disciplines that have emerged over the centuries. And in fact, if I, I haven't occasionally buttonholed some philosophers at the end of uh, uh, talks or meetings saying, well, why do you want to study th th this way of doing it? I don't think this is the right concept for, 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 for the, the, the next revolutionary subject. And they look at me with a blank stare, next revolutionary subject, what has this got to do with philosophy? So philosophy, philosophical life is different than the foundational life. The clearest exception to the normal modus operandi in the philosophical life is, of course, the emergence of foundations of mathematics. This involves the analysis of such truly fundamental concepts as rigorous proof, natural number, deterministic algorithm, etc., and involves such great practitioners of the philosophical life as Aristotle, Frege, Russell, and others. So it's certainly true that sometimes something comes out of philosophy for the foundational life. No question about it. In the mathematical life, there's a focus on the rigorous development of detailed information within well-defined frameworks that have emerged for a variety of purposes, often from outside mathematics. These developments take on a life of their own without generally being evaluated in light of the original purposes, purposes that generated them. Instead, developments are normally evaluated in terms of beauty, originality, and complexity. The scientific life, as normally practiced in academia, generally comes in at least two very different forms. Experimental scientific life and theoretical scientific life, of course, the most profound figures were able to combine these two lives in path-breaking ways. 
My understanding of science has not been sufficiently deep for my foundational life to interact with the scientific life. I have found too many irresistible opportunities present in the foundational life related to mathematics and to a lesser or limited extent, computer science, education, and music. But I do have the ambition of applying the lessons that we can learn from the great and profound successes in foundations of mathematics to the future foundations of science. Bringing the foundations of physical science up to anything like the level of where Gödel saw the foundations of mathematics as a student in Vienna is going to, be going to require a profound rethinking of the most elemental aspects of both mathematics and science in ways that we can only begin to imagine. This is not meant as an insult to physical scientists. Foundations of physical science appears to be transcendentally more difficult than foundations of mathematics, which has proved difficult enough. It took till the early part of the 20th century for the foundations of mathematics to become the great intellectual structure that it is, with mathematical logic being spun off as a substantial area of mathematics, now with significant applications to other areas of mathematics. Mathematical logic is a spin-off of the foundational life, of the foundations of mathematics. It's not intrinsically important or interesting in and of itself, only in relation to its roots. In, yet mathematics has had a very long development, starting in antiquity. There was already a vast development of mathematics well before foundations of mathematics took hold in anything like its present form. In the foundational life, one should expect to experience very long gestation periods with a great deal of trial and error. It seems to require multidisciplinary people who think very differently than the mainstream with great imagination, power, rigor, and inspiration. Almost all governmental, academic, and philanthropic institutions worldwide, among them all, I know of only one that might be persuaded to invest carefully and wisely towards bringing the foundations of physical science up to anything resembling the early levels of the foundations of mathematics, which will require deep, organized, and intense collaborative efforts involving the right kinds of open-minded mathematicians, logicians, philosophers, computer scientists, and physical scientists and that one institution that may be persuadable is the John Templeton Foundation. I've heard that the prevailing attitude among physical scientists is shut up and calculate, which is a favorite phrase of um, our friend who can't make it here. <laughs> and uh, the prevailing attitude among mathematicians is correspondingly shut up and prove. As I understand it, talking to Anton about this once, there are two kinds of physicists, the overwhelming, overwhelming majority who say, shut up and calculate, and then the small minority who say, this doesn't make any sense, what does it all mean? But uh, I wish he was here to speak for himself about this. Uh, similarly, the overwhelming number of mathematicians say, shut up and prove, I don't want to hear what, what, what it constitutes a rigorous proof or what the axioms of, of mathematics are or the, what the primitives of mathematics could be. Shut up and prove is the usual attitude. Now, in the case of the foundations of mathematics, this wide range of deep phenomena consists of mathematical practice, both pure and applied. I believe that foundations of applied mathematics is grossly underdeveloped and will play a major role in the foundational life of the future. Questions like, it, um, why is mathematics useful? Uh, is mathematics useful? Uh, and, so, and how is mathematics useful? And where, and where is mathematics useful? Uh, needs a deep analysis. There's a lot of uh, semi-truths and myths and something like that. All right, so a little history here that you all well know. A profound uneasiness, how did foundations of mathematics uh, arise and get going, and so forth. A profound uneasiness in mathematics, say around 1800, set the stage for the emergence of the foundations of mathematics. There's a profound uneasiness in physical science now, which is fully recognized by the it doesn't seem to make any sense, what does it all mean crowd, 
if not recognized by the shut up and calculate crowd. I expect that in the future we'll be able to make fruitful connections between these two cases of profound uneasiness. The profound uneasiness of the mathematicians in 1800, which led to the foundations of mathematics, and the profound uneasiness in physical science right now. Um, I expect in the future we'll be able to make fruitful connections between these two situations. Now one of them has been led to a tremendous positive development. The other is just sitting there, uh, you know, in a state of, um, of uh, confusion. So uh, there's the possibility of lessons to be learned. Uh, fruitful connections between these two cases of profound uneasiness, which are sufficient to let foundations of MX lead the way by example, to break through developments in the foundations of physical science. To set the stage for the emergence of foundations of mathematics, consider what foundations Max looked like around 1800. For example, here's a quote taken from Morris Klein, Mathematical Thought from Ancient and Modern Times, page 947. By about 1800, the mathematicians began to be concerned about the looseness of the concepts and proofs of the vast branches of analysis. The very concept of a function was not clear. The use of series without regard to convergence and divergence had produced paradoxes and disagreements. The controversy about the representations of functions by trigonometric series had introduced further confusion. And of course, the fundamental notions of derivative and integral have never been properly defined. All these difficulties finally brought on dissatisfaction with the logical status of analysis. So sometimes, some leading mathematicians care about foundations for a while. This should be uh, uh, kept in mind. This profound uneasiness led directly to what is called the installation of rigor in mathematics. The first base step was to make a series of fundamental definitions based on the still unanalyzed number systems taking their basic properties for granted. There was gradual emergence and acceptance during the 19th century of the fundamental definitions we use today, such as limit of a sequence of reals, sum of an infinite sequence, series of reals, limit of a real function at a point, continuity of real functions, derivative of a real function at a point, definite interval of a real function over an interval, through the so-called epsilon delta methodology. Eventually, there was full realization that some of these entities may not exist, and that tacit assumptions of existence were responsible for a number of paradoxes and confusions. For example, if you look at one plus minus one plus one, dot, 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 this does not exist, avoiding paradoxes emanating from the rearrangement of terms. If you rearrange those terms, you can get, in the most obvious way, you can get one or you can get zero. You know, you play around with the rearrangements. So, um, or the obvious rearrangements. So a new standard of proof emerged in which such definitions were fully incorporated. In other words, you have to define things once and for all. You don't change the definitions in the middle of the proof or forget about what the definitions are or make up your own. You know, I mean, these became understood. And, um, However, it was not until the late 19th century that the number systems and the function concept were appropriately rigorized. For, example, for instance, Weierstrass is credited for first realizing that to establish the properties of continuous functions, one needs a rigorous treatment of the real number system. So the real number system um, had two approaches. And, and what's very interesting about this, of course, is how does mathematics tolerate multiple definitions? Actually, you, it doesn't tolerate multiple definitions literally in the same tr proof. You can't use one definition in the beginning of the proof and then change the definition in the middle. Uh, you can get into serious trouble if you do that. I mean, obviously everybody's doing that, right? But, you know, for convenience, but we're all grown-ups now. Back then, you know, they, they, were, they were, you know, they, they were just, uh, you know, trying to... Uh, see their way. All right, so one is the Dedekind cut definition and the other is the Cauchy sequence approach. The Dedekind cut definition involves sets of rational numbers and the Cauchy sequence definition involves sequence of rational numbers. In the Dedekind cut approach, real numbers are literally certain sets of rationals, in, at least in one formulation. But the treatment of multiplication is unnatural. In the Cauchy sequence approach, real numbers are literally certain sets of sequences of rationals since you have to take the equivalence classes. Asterisk, you can decide not to take the equivalence classes, which is a, a, an approach that the constructivists push, especially Eric Bishop. 
not, not, not even bother with the equivalence class, but that's a, 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 a separate point. The equivalence classes are the normal way to do it. Addition and multiplication are now both natural. A confusing aspect of the foundations of mathematics is the emergence of multiple definitions for the same concept. Obviously, these multiple definitions cannot be taken literally, or at least not literally simultaneously, or whatever, however you want to put it. Uh, good ways of looking at the phenomena of multiple definitions had to wait until the 20th century where appropriate notions of mathematical structure and isomorphism were developed. For example, the real number system is unique up to isomorphism as a complete ordered field. However, this is so-called synthetic approach raises additional issues. Where do these structures come from and where do the isomorphisms between them come from? The fact, in fact, the right way to set up the synthetic approach systematically is still a topic of controversy and research to this day, especially if you want a coherent philosophical treatment. Coming back to the development of the real number system through Dedekind cuts and Cauchy sequences, notice how it relies on the more elementary rational number system. Rational numbers are normally defined in, as either ordered pairs of integers in reduced form or equivalence classes of ordered pairs of integers. Synth synthetically, rationals form the unique ordered field with no proper subfield. Then you have to worry about the integers. Uh, and. Uh, the integers have to be are defined, say, from the uh, from the natural numbers, or the non-negative integers, if you want. Uh, and uh, now, the, however, once you get down to the natural numbers, you now have additional issues. There's a synthetic definition due to piano, but ultimately, synthetic definitions need a foundation. Although at this stage, the foundations, I, by the way, I'm not somebody who's going to tolerate people who tell me that you don't need foundations for unclear things. That's only after the fact because people, uh, uh, you know, have had that stuff in the background done for them. Uh, I'm not somebody who thinks arbitrary foundations of everything is going to be relevant, or uh, the right kind of foundations is important everywhere. I may be out of fashion, but I am over 60 years old now, so I have a right to that that point of view. Although at this stage the foundations of mathematics was greatly clarified from the chaos and confusion of 1800, a major new simplifying idea was needed in order to create this sought after ultimate foundations. And that is, we needed a grand unifying idea for the foundations of mathematics, which is at present, the most convenient one is the set concept. The truly unifying set concept is not the ordinary one of sets of atomic objects. It's a more sophisticated one where elements of sets are not restricted and may themselves be sets. Set theory was intensively developed as a branch of mathematics by George Cantor starting in the late 19th century. In pure set theory, all objects are sets. The only concept is that of membership. Equality can be treated in one of two ways that are essentially equivalent. Uh, the first of, of view has been a, is, the lo, is the one that's been most commonly adopted. Equality is a primitive, we can do, uh, which we can do in all contexts uh, whatsoever. We assert that if two sets have the same elements, they're equal, and we can avoid using equality all and assert that if two sets have the same elements, even if the elements are the same sets. Now, many of you might be wondering why I'm telling you these things that you already know. One of the reasons is these are the kind of moves that are totally unclear what the corresponding moves would be if you were to do foundations of physical science. This is the bread and butter of our trade in the early days. It's not clear what that bread and butter should look like in, uh, for physical science. That's why I'm part of, part of the reason I'm, I'm doing this, okay? So, all right. So, uh, now, pure set theory constitutes a very bold grand unification, yet it works very well and has stood the test of time, and it's based on objects that are unchanging with completely objective properties. We do not incorporate directly in mathematics today time and observers. This immutability is very striking. Consider the familiar case of a moving point, which might model a thrown projectile. Instead of working directly with a single point that is changing its position, like anybody outside mathematics does, especially if they're ignorant of mathematics, we instead work with a single object that is unchanging. This single object is much more complicated than a mere point. This single object is, of course, a function from an interval in the reals, generally, uh, into the reals, generally. So 
part and parcel of this rigorization process was in fact to, uh, 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 to replace uh, uh, physical concepts like moving points with, function, with much more complicated things uh, which are immutable and don't change and have no observers and no time involved. The move from changing points to fixed immutable objects appears as a crucial step towards rigor. The resulting function is analyzed in terms of limits, derivatives, intervals, local, absolute, extreme, etc. Now you might say this is just a superficial, silly uh, little point, but I'm not convinced of that. This may be at the heart of the, of the, of the disconnect between the foundations of mathematics and the foundations of physical science, which doesn't really exist. So, you know, it may actually be an, a very important point. All right. Yet this move, perhaps, and other related moves may represent the basis for a disconnect, as I said. Perhaps now that we have such deep understanding of the foundations of mathematics, we should experiment with enriching set theory through the direct incorporation of changing objects instead of the mutable objects, maybe even put the observer back in. I'm not sure the observer was ever quite in mathematics that, that much, but uh, even more radical would be the introduction, I, I keep, yeah, I guess I knew what I was talking about when I wrote this. Yeah, you know, I, maybe I should read it. All right, there are indications of what can be gained by incorporating even a very limited form of changing objects into mathematics. I consider what I call the exploding set theoretic universe. There are two set theoretic universes, one now and one later, which is formed upon an explosion. Principles related, relating the two universes are proposed in this uh, uh, thing I did. This situation supports the construction of models of set theory with very large cardinals, uh, uh, rank into rank even, I believe, and even higher without choice. So you can found the whole large cardinal business by simply an exploding universe without having any set theoretic infrastructure, without having any, any of the usual set theoretic infrastructure. So this is suggestive, and this is only two points in time. The beginning and now, right? All right, I expect that the evolving universe, or the evolving set theoretic universe, or the evolving mathematical universe, will become a major topic in future foundational life. Remember, I was supposed to talk about the future also. With the establishment of the interpretation of mathematics and set theory, the current foundations of mathematics took shape. However, there's a crucial missing element. This is logical structure. So the appropriate logical structure for foundations of mathematics is given by what is now called first-order predicate calculus with equality. This calculus is generally credited to Gottlieb Frege from the late 19th century. Logical structure, at least ideally, applies to all deductive reasoning, regardless of whether it is confined to mathematics. However, in practice, there's an utter lack of substantial examples of deductive reasoning with anything like the depth and complexity of deductive reasoning in mathematics. Instead, outside mathematics, we almost entirely rely on instincts and common sense. This is true, generally speaking, even in the realm of science. Consider all the reasoning that goes into the design of a delicate and complex experiment, which, are, which is supposed to confirm or refute theories. You know, you're actually building the, building the, the glass and the, and the measuring tools and the, and the uh, laboratory benches and everything else, right? Okay, I mean, <laughs> and, and the particle beams and all that stuff. Okay, this is, there's a vast array of hidden assumptions, most of which resist clear formulation. To say that this experiment actually does confirm this theory. I expect that the logical analysis of scientific experimentation will become a major component in the foundational life of the future. Returning to logical structure within mathematics, we first need the notion of an assertion. For this, we use variables, membership, connectives, and quantifiers. Obviously, you know all about this, but you budding, but you budding foundations of physical scientists of the future need to ponder that move. That move was a, not a trivial move to split things up that way. We then have the so-called axioms and rules of inference for logic. They are to apply to any situation. They don't depend on what's, they don't depend upon what sets are or what membership means. They do depend on the meaning of equality. All right. Firstly, an elaborate system of abbreviations and conventions have developed in order to support the construction of actual mathematical assertions. Secondly, mathematicians generally require a massive infusion of, of additional axioms and rules of inference of logic, which are not theoretically new, but which are needed in the practical sense. We, we know that you can write very simple axioms and rules for predicate calculus that are very convenient for proving theorems, 
but they're totally useless to use because they're too sparse, they're too thin. And then you add a whole bunch of new stuff, but it's not, they're not new in the usual sense of new because of the girdle completeness there. Thirdly, it is just too burdensome for a human to take care of every detail in a non-straightforward argument. All of this leads to the obvious question of whether formally correct proofs actually have been constructed, or even if it can be constructed for substantial mathematical theorems. The answer is yes, but with the help of a computer, the biggest inventory of actual formally correct proofs emanates from the proof assistant called Mizar, and their arrivals, Isabel Koch, HOL and so forth. Systems like Mizar keep track of and help supply details. However, at present, they're very limited and primitive, meaning they're a pain to do anything with. But you can do something. You can't. It's an impressive, impressive achievements have been made. All right, now, we have to understand trivialities much better than we do. What is badly needed is a better understanding of trivial inferences where the computer supplies the trivial inferences and the human supplies the non-trivial inferences. One also needs a much richer supply of humanly created algorithms for fragments of mathematics that can be applied automatically and effectively by the computer. I expect that the development of algorithms for fragments of mathematics and an understanding of trivialities will be a major part of the future of foundations of mathematics um, where the creation of formally correct proofs will be greatly facilitated and expanded. I further expect that this expansion of the inventory of formally correct proofs will lead to a new level of understanding of the structure of actual mathematical proofs. So now we have that gold standard of mathematical proof, the ZFC axiom system, but experience has shown that ZFC is vast overkill for the vast preponderance of mathematics. This led me to the development of so-called reverse mathematics, which robustly classifies mathematical theorems according to the logical principles needed for their proof. The classification is supported by the fact that so many mathematical theorems are demonstrably equivalent to logical principles far weaker than ZFC. In reverse mathematics, logical principles are proved from mathematical theorems, hence the name reverse mathematics. I understood, I introduced the base theory, RCA naught for reverse mathematics over which the reversals are made, and I set up the field in the late 1960s to mid-70s based on that system. Ideally, there should be no base theory, or any base theory should consist solely of mathematical assertions that are explicitly essential in all of mathematics, explicitly essential, e.g. the discrete ordered ring axioms for the integers. I already envisioned and wrote about this kind of strict reverse mathematics before I set up reverse mathematics. I chose the present setup because of its special clarity and problem generating power. In fact, it is now clear that strict reverse mathematics would have been totally premature at that time. I expect the further development of strict reverse mathematics that I've begun recently will be a major part of the future of foundations of mathematics. In particular, uh, this paper I wrote claims uh, that with no base theory you can get a system you can get off the ground. In other words, you can get a system which, which uh, I, I say a system has logical strength if it interprets exponential function arithmetic. That's my definition of having logical strength. I mean, it's not, maybe not a standard definition. And you can get a system that has logical strength out of stuff that is um, uh, unimpeachably explicit. Uh, that claim is 99% clear. I want to write a paper uh, covering the 1% objection. All right. Now, fundamental foundational moves, consistency, completeness, and incompleteness. The issues of consistency, completeness, and incompleteness have framed the major developments of the foundations of mathematics since the time of Kurt Gödel. A formal system is consistent if and only if it does not prove a contradiction. The idea is that a system is consistent, then it is worthless because it doesn't distinguish between any statements. Uh, it can prove all statements and therefore makes no contribution to separating the true from the false. The idea has been floated that if we remove the logical inference that from a contradiction we can derive any statement, call it, it's called, sometimes called explosion, then an inconsistent system might still have some value in that it may not prove all statements. At present, this intriguing proposal lacks sufficient justification. For instance, you can find here that, that the rejection of explosion entails the rejection of at least one of three principles, each one of which is definitely used in actual mathematics. 
so I note the phenomena that this idea of, um, it's called paraconsistency, has some real um, uh, following in the philosophy community, which doesn't bother to check whether it conforms in any way whatsoever to the structure of any deductive uh, subject with any depth, in particular mathematics. And one is perfectly willing in, 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 in some parts of philosophy to continue this study as if, as if it was some sort of foundations of math or, or just continue this study. And, and, and without that basis, it's not part of, I, I summarily reject it as part of the foundational life until it gets to such a justification. A counter might be to argue that mathematics can, can be appropriately developed without, for example, from A and not A or B derived B. However, this has not been established. So, yeah. There's a much cleverer, clearer way in which an inconsistent system can be of value. That is where all proofs of a contradiction are of ridiculously enormous size. Unfortunately, this does not represent any kind of solution to paradoxes, such as Russell's paradox or the Bradley 40 paradox, since they involve proofs of small size. So that's not the purpose. Gödel's second incompleteness theorem, formulated in modern terms, establishes that con ZFC cannot be proved in ZFC unless ZFC, uh, ZFC is in fact inconsistent. Uh, one version of Hilbert's program is to establish con ZFC within piano arithmetic, or even a weak fragment of a piano arithmetic, where Hilbert regarded uh, which, a weak fragment that Hilbert would regard as indisputable. But then, from Gödel's second incompleteness theorem, we have ZF's, con ZFC cannot be proved in T. So we now review four, and that put an end to the usual interpretation of, uh, of uh, the usual interpretation of Hilbert's uh, program. But there are some other interpretations. I believe that I, I discuss it in this here, but not right away. We now review four great incompleteness theorems due to Gödel, Pressburger, and Tarski. So the first uh, completeness theorem is Gödel's, a sentence in predicate calculus is true in all structures if and only of the usual. The above theorem establishes that the usual axioms and rules of inference of logic, let's call it logic, are not subject to any expansion that is compatible with its intended purpose. Intended purpose is being important. The second completeness theorem is due to Pressburger. A sentence about the ordered group of integers is true if and only if it's proven from the axioms for discrete ordered groups and the quotient remainder axioms combined with logic. In other words, I want to cast some things as, as completeness theorems very specifically. Uh, there's Tarski's completeness theorem. A, a sentence about the ordered field of real numbers is true if and only if it's proven from the axioms for ordered real closed fields combined with logic. And Tarski also has this, a sentence about the field of complex numbers is true if and only if it is proven from the axioms for algebraically closed fields of characteristic zero combined with logic. Okay, now let's turn to Gödel's first incompleteness theorem. The, um, the T be a consistent extension of a system called Q, assume the axioms of T consist of finally many axioms and axiom schemes. There's a sentence that's neither provable nor refutable in T. This is a good formulation that doesn't pass, have to pass through the issue of what, a, of what an RE set or recursive set of axioms are. Covers a lot of territory. As a corollary, there's no finite set of axioms and axiom schemes when combined with the usual axioms and rules of inference of logic prove exactly the true sentences about the ring of integers. And the incompleteness theorem in this form, there's no finite set of axioms and axiom schemes which when combined with the usual axioms and axioms, axioms and rules of inference of logic proves exactly the true sentences about the field of rationals. We can package various things this way. to Julia Robinson. All right. The first example of a mathematically natural assertion that is neither provable nor refutable in ZFC is as follows. Every infinite set of reals is in one one correspondence with the integers or the reals. Now I'm going to say something a little later about the concept of mathematically natural. I believe one of the fields of the future in the foundation of life is a scientific theory of mathematical natural, mathematically natural, which is sufficiently, which is sufficiently 
uh, robust to support uh, definitive research. Okay, well, I wanna, wanna make that prediction. All right, now consistency and the incorporation of new notions. I'm expecting that some natural condition on, oh, this is the extension of Hilbert's program. Okay, I'm, ex I'm expecting that some natural condition on proofs in ZFC will be discovered where, first of all, it's shown that all proofs before 2011 in the published mathematical literature are proofs in ZFC obeying the natural condition. Two, it is provable in ZFC or even in piano arithmetic that there's no proof of a contradiction in ZFC obeying the natural condition. So there's a restriction unknown at the moment on proofs uh, that is actually can be confirmed by, 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 by looking. In other words, all proofs are blue, okay? And you go look and you find all proofs actually in the published literature by serious mathematicians doing serious work is, are blue, okay? And now we know how to, and, but they use that, you know, they might even use serious parts of, of, uh, of ZFC um, or certainly maybe substantially beyond piano arithmetic, uh, but then we can prove them outright consistent. Now, of course, what's going to happen is, of course, probably not by a blue consistency proof. In other words, one, one should be able to show that um, a, the, a general result that you can't get blue consistency uh, with a blue, con you can't get a blue consistency proof of blue mathematics. Okay. That's probably going to be a very, in fact, that ought to be a general theorem about natural conditions. In other words, if there's a natural condition on natural conditions that says that if you have if the natural, you can fill in the blank, okay. Uh, one finds that uh, Gödel's second incompleteness theorem is very hard-nosed and very um, uh, uh, immutable, subject, to, it, 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 it still lives on, even if you try to uh, get around it, it's very difficult to deal with as you know. Okay, many years ago I discovered a finite form of Gödel's second incompleteness theorem, which has subsequently been refined by Pudlock. Search, roughly speaking, that any proof in piano arithmetic that is, um, that there is no short inconsistency proof in ZFC must be long, unless ZFC is in fact has a short inconsistency proof. Uh, however, the results thus far do not bear directly on actual mathematical practice, since the results are all stated asymptotically. They're all stated asymptotically. And you know what happens asymptotically. There can be a lot of overhead. And the overhead can be larger than the, than the size of, of the proofs you want to talk about, that you really want to talk about. So this has to be revisited. It would appear that when the asymptotics are removed, the numbers reflect large overhead, weakening the practical import. There is also the issue of realistic proof systems that adequately reflect mathematical practice. Finally, there, is, there are issues related to the P equals NP problem that will limit the strength of the results that one's going to get, at least until the appropriate forms of P equals P not equal NP are resolved. Now, I've been developing a, a, something called concept calculus in which basic common sense concepts from outside science are logically analyzed and given plausible axiomizations. Um, I then show that these resulting axiomizations are mutually interpretable with various set theories, including ZFC and ZFC extended by so-called large cardinal hypotheses. As a corollary, this provides consistency proofs of ZFC using the consistency of such axiomizations, of ZFC and also with the large cardinals. If these axiomizations are suitably augmented with non-problematic principles involving the natural numbers, then these axiomizations become sufficient to state and prove consistency of ZFC and extensions thereof. In fact, one, one example I mentioned earlier, the, ex, the exploding universe was a case uh, of that. But I have some other uh, uh, things that are much more related to physical notions. Now, whether or not the, the stuff I did related to physical notions has, is a good step or is related to the program of foundations of physical science is very much unclear. I, I, I kind of doubt it, but it, it's, it's an obvious issue that would come, uh, come up. All right. Now, I expect concept calculus to be a major part of the foundational life, forging unexpected new links between mathematics and philosophy. 
The complete axiomizations of the ordered group of integers, the ordered real closed field of reals, and the field of complex numbers of characteristics zero were proved by the method of quantifier elimination. This is a fundamental technique used by monotheorists in many contexts. Furthermore, they do not emphasize completeness, but rather the properties of the definable sets in such structures. In particular, they have formulated a fundamental property of linearly ordered structures known as O-minimality. This asserts that every definable subset of the domain is a finite unit of intervals with endpoints in the domain. Uh, a surprising array of properties involving the higher dimensional definable sets followed by very interesting arguments just from O-minimality. Yet completeness is not a consequence of O-minimality even in the fundamental case of the ordered field of reals with exponentiation added, which is known to be O-minimal. Unfortunately, even deciding the equalities between ex exponential constants constitutes hopefully the difficult number theory at the present time. However, there's a famous number theory at conjecture called Chandy Wells conjecture, way out of reach at the present time, but it's very powerful. And we have a result of McIntyre and Wilkie that says that every sentence about the ordered field of reals together with the exponential function is provable or refutable in ZFC plus Chandy Wells conjecture. In fact, ZFC can be replaced by an explicitly given natural set of axioms. This is my, my way of stating McIntyre Wilkie. It may not be McIntyre Wilkie's favorite way of stating it, am I right? <laughs> I expect that a number of developments in completeness will play a substantial role in the foundations of mathematics in the future. These include the following. An understanding of when the expansion of the ordered field of real numbers by a real power series is O-minimal in terms of basic properties of the power series. An understanding of the scope of O-minimal expansions of the ordered field of reals, including the issue of the possible growth rates at infinity. A finite form of O-minimality revealing its underlying finite combinatorial content. Let me repeat that mysterious sentence. A finite form of finite form now, I'm a finite forms person. I spent my whole life, you'll see in a moment I'll talk about it, I spent my whole life uh, 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 giving finite forms of large cardinal hypotheses. This is what I do for a living, okay? But a finite form of O-minimality re uh, revealing its underlying finite common coral content. The systematic development of completeness theorems throughout mathematics without requiring O-minimality. Various fruitful weakenings of O-minimality have been fruitfully explored. These still involve considering all definable subsets of the domain, but I expect that various imaginative restrictions on the sentences considered in various contexts to emerge that support new kinds of completeness theorems. So you won't be looking at, after a while, people won't be scared to look at significant fragments of predicate calculus and not try to use the whole predicate calculus because the whole predicate calculus blocks you from so many delicious situations where you get undecidability too quickly. Incompleteness and concreteness, simplicity and naturalness. Concrete mathematical incompleteness. I'm gonna say it again. Concrete mathematical incompleteness. That's the title of the first, of the introduction to a book uh, on the web I have called Boolean Relation Theory and Incompleteness. The first, the introduction, the title of the introduction is called Concrete Mathematical Incompleteness and the introduction runs 251 pages so you won't be able to read it in one sitting unless you um, don't sleep like I don't sleep which I never met anybody else to try to do this. But anyways, is there a mathematically natural concrete mathematical statement which cannot be proved or refuted in ZFC? Let me repeat that. Is there a mathematically natural, concrete mathematical statement which cannot be proved or refuted in ZFC? This is the basic issue in concrete mathematical incompleteness that is so crucial for the future of the incompleteness phenomenon and for foundations of mathematics generally. And here is the state of the art. And all intervals are intervals in the rationals. Okay, so. The maximal clique embedding theorem says the following. Every order invariant graph on the closed unit interval to the kth power has a maximal clique. Let's stop right there. Okay, a graph is the usual definition of a, of a um, symmetric, an irreflexive symmetric relation on a set. That's what a graph is. And a clique means any two distinct elements are related. And a maximal clique is a clique which cannot be properly extended 
to another clique. It's not properly contained in another clique. I, I gave these definitions because I want you to be so bored and disgusted with me having to say this triv these definitions that everybody knows because I want to emphasize how natural they are. You wouldn't have been so bored and disgusted with me giving those definitions I just gave if they weren't very natural, right? Okay, so now we have a structure theory we're thinking of. Oh, what does order invariant mean? Order invariant, a relation is said to be order invariant if only if, if um, whenever two tuples have the same order type, have the same order type, one is in there if not the other is in there. So this is a very, this is, by the way, order invariant relations in this context are the same as the definable relations with the, with the less than relation because of the um, well-known quantifier elimination for dense linear orderings, okay? All right, so every order, so these are, these are, good, these are good guys. These are good guys. Every, the order invariant graphs on, a, um, on, on the closed unit interval of rationals uh, uh, to the K, those are good guys. There are only finitely many of them, by the way. Only finitely many. But there's only finitely many, usually that's pretty good. All right. Okay, so we have these. It has a maximal clique with a non-trivial embedding whose range and fixed points each form an interval. The notion of embedding here um, can be the usual one for model theory if you want. Um, in other words, it's a one-dimensional map that's 1-1 one, one that preserves the uh, uh, clique. The clique is a K or a relation. Or you can take the notion of embedding to be only forward, as somebody, you know, as people might want to do in graph theory, more prefer it just to be forward. The if and only of version is what model theorists usually use. Okay, so every order invariant graph on zero, one to k has a maximal clique with a non-trivial embedding, meaning it's not the identity. See, how many times would our friends in set theory bother to define what non-trivial means <laughs> when they're talking about embedding? Usually, usually not. See, so I'm doing this just to make a point, right? Uh, with a non-trivial embedding whose range and fixed points each form an interval. So you look at the range, it's got to be an interval, and the, if you look at the set of fixed points, it's got to form an interval also. There's a simpler statement. Uh, oh, and here's a variant. Uh, 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 no, I, before I get to that, I want to state there's a simpler statement here that says every order invariant graph has a maximal clique with a non-trivial embedding, period. That's not a problem. That's straightforward, completely straightforward. Uh, indiscernibles, okay. Then there's another theorem, every order, another weakening, every order invariant graph has a maximal clique with a non-trivial embedding whose range forms an interval, period. Again, not a problem. That can be done. Uh, that one, I'm not sure what the logical strength of that is, but it's way, 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 way below ZFC. All right, next variant. Every order invariant graph has a maximal clique with a non-trivial embedding whose fixed points form an interval. We're not gonna talk about the range anymore, just the fixed points uh, form an interval. Well, I think that that also is independent of ZFC, but I, there's a serious hole in the proof I have. So that one, really, I have, to, I have to work on. The other one, I think, is okay. So that's where the boundary is. I don't quite understand. So, I, there's, so there's a challenge here, and that is get rid of the word range, whose, range, whose fixed points form an interval. Now, isn't that, that, that's great, because that would get rid of a lot of words. All right, so, so, but we do, we do have it for this. I believe. I'm... Um, I'm hoping to ha produce a manuscript by the end of the year for this. That's my plan. And if I don't, write me a nasty uh, email. All right, now there's another variant that's much more explicit. Every order invariant graph on the interval with zero thrown away, with zero thrown away, has a maximal clique with this particular embedding. This embedding is the embedding min of q comma q over two and you can get a picture of what that looks like. It's now become my favorite function. Min of Q comma Q over two, okay. And um, 
Uh, now, why did I throw away zero? I just want to make the statement more complicated. No, well, if you put zero in there, if you put zero in there on both places, in other words, don't take zero out at, at all. Keep, you know, keep zero in there on both places. It's refutable. If you keep zero in the first one, but throw it out in the second one, then it doesn't make any sense because an embedding is supposed to be total, but you can say it's a partial embedding. You know, I mean, the obvious notion of partial embedding just is there, right? If you do that, then I claim that's also independent of the axioms. That, that would be independent of the axioms. All right. And in fact, these are equivalent to the consistency of model cardinals of finite order. When I say consistency, I don't mean one consistency. I mean con. Now, I expect that these examples will permeate the whole of mathematics and some of them will be explicitly finite. Now, why would I think that this would permeate the whole of mathematics? Because I'm suggesting a, a theory that goes like this. In natural context, there's always gonna be a maximal object with some, prop, some subject to some, subject to uh, some, uh, some theory of, of its structure, some structure theory. So there's going, to be, there's going to be a subject called the structure of maxim, maximal objects. And maximal ideals will be an example. Maximal solutions to PDEs will be an example. Uh, whatever you want. Maximal cliques will be an example. Uh, I can do all this in the continuous, by the way. It's just that, it's just that I, 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 want to, I, I don't want to add non-concreteness. So there is, in fact, there isn't a barring of this uh, uh, with completeness, as with, 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 uh, with uh, using real, the real interval instead. I, I, I'll check that, but I think that's true. So the fact that I mentioned, you know, PDE, in this particular case, I don't believe that, uh, I, I don't believe that uh, uh, using the reals is, is, a, is a total um, disaster. You know, I think that, in fact, uh, this can be done. All right, now here's the problem. On the one hand, I'm using, I'm able to do this if this, if this is right. I do produce a manuscript by the end of the year. If I do this, I've done it with just the ordering of the rationals. And that's a very, very small amount of mathematics, the ordering of the rationals. In fact, you know, that's a tame part of mathematics. I mean, I mean it's, not, it's not tame if you use it use it uh, uh, this way, because the notion of maximal clique, okay, but, but the fact of the matter is that, that that's a, a very primitive amount of mathematics, the ordering on the rationals. So the positive scenario is that once you give me any material in, 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 in uh, sophisticated mathematics or even slightly sophisticated mathematics, I can use it to my advantage, maybe make the statements even better than these. But certainly I could, I could accommodate uh, you know, the group structure or something like that. That's the positive uh, uh, scenario. Negative scenario is, for some reason or another, if I have to walk into something that already has some structure, I can't use the structure, I can't use the structure I'm given in mathematics. I have to sort of re get rid of it and do something awkward. So I don't, I'm not able to do anything. So I have to find out whether the, the actual structure in mathematics that goes beyond just simply ordering the rationals is going to work positive wonders for me or is it going to destroy it or is it going to destroy it you know it's not clear yet or something in the middle it's much too early so I, I have to first figure out whether I really can produce on this thing because it's, it's 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 tricky but I, I think it should be okay I wanted to tell you about it even before I wrote it up I've been fooling around with it for a couple of weeks but anyways um, uh, there's also the um, there's also the program of, of making these statements explicitly finite. The way, that the, the way that the first one is stated, if you look at the first one, a maximal clique embedding theorem, if you look at that one, it's quite easy to see that this is, um, would be called implicitly pi zero one. Because it's in fact, in the, in the form of a sentence of a scheme in predicate calculus, is in fact, it has models. It's clearly a, it takes that form, that a scheme in predicate calculus has models. That's a simple exercise. Notion of maximal clique is first order. Uh, the, uh, the interval is first order. You know, it's just dense linear order. Uh, intervals are always first order. So it's just straight like that. And in fact, if you want to uh, go further with that, it's, it's quite easy by hand 
to write down that scheme in predicate calculus, but it's also quite easy by hand to write, the, write it down as um, a universal formula, as a universal sentence. Because you, 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 just, you can just add one scolum function. It's just, it's just a very simple scolum function. It's not like you're talking about abstract predicate calculus. So you can actually display the, the, uh, the, the universal sentence. You can display the universal sentence. I have, uh, the explain, you can display the universal sentence and, um, and then point to that and say, look, the general theory applicable in many, many mathematical situations like presented, finally presented groups being trivial and things like that, 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 th that they're always um, pi zero one, that they're always given by an algorithm doesn't terminate. So as, as part of the general principle that many mathematicians can be familiar with. So before one even gets an explicit finite form, there's a whole bunch of implicit pi zero one material connected with the first statement. The second one, not so clear because um, uh, uh, if you think about it, that's, that's less clear. But uh, nevertheless, um, you, nevertheless, I still believe that there's going to be some very clear finite form of this statement that's almost as good as this statement. The numbers, the number of bits needed to state them are tiny. So you now have a result that a certified language which has got, a, which has got an A plus certificate by the uh, uh, American Math Society maybe or the World Math Congress, somebody's got a statement with, uh, with uh, or maybe this one has, uh, is a, there's a statement with 14 symbols that's independent of the axioms of ZFC. And that's not going to be cheap. You can't do that by diagonalization. You can't do that by diagonalization. Thank you very much. So, questions, please. Uh, I certainly agree that in the wake of Gödel's work, completeness, consistency, and completeness, these issues have been uh, fundamental to the foundations of mathematics. I think you maybe overstated it slightly saying that they were the leading or, or the dominant issue. But keep in mind that there are other issues in the foundations of mathematics, in particular recently, uh, the distinction between completeness and incompleteness seems to be supplanted by the distinction between classifiable and unclassifiable in mathematics. And there have been dramatic developments in that distinction which have had significant impact on mathematics itself without, without issues of trying to deal with naturalness. Because in fact, these examples, such as in the theory of C-star algebras, uh, where the subject had been attempting to find a classification, now with the methods of descriptive set theory, have been shown to be unclassifiable. So I just wanted to suggest that there is a, there's a new development wow. analogous to the completeness and completeness distinction. Okay, well, I think that's, that's now occurring okay, well, with classifiability. First, first, of all, and first of all, this talk cannot cover um, everything. The idea of, of talking about what, is it, what does it mean to classify things, and, and my role in that subject is considerable, as you know, um, uh, was something that uh, in a longer form of this talk would be discussed. Um, and I do think that a field of the future is what does classification really mean, particularly in the finite. Uh, another thing I would have emphasized more is I think what's going to happen is that logic and mathematics itself is going to be more concerned with the, with the finite than it is even now. I think that that's really where the action is going to be in the finite. And there, the question of what classification means is going to become also extremely important. And it's quite different. The finite is usually quite different than the way we, we normally deal with the infinite. Uh, uh, so uh, yes, the issue of classification. I think there are at least, there are probably at least a half a dozen big things like that. What does classification mean? And what is it going to look like in the future uh, that are omitted in this talk? Uh, and, um, uh, but that is partly because of the time pressure I was under, uh, and, um, uh, the fact that I was really, uh, uh, 
uh, I had to limit, limit the focus. And, and, I, and in fact, if I had to do this talk over, all over again, I probably would have had a, a couple of pages on other issues and I would have included classification issues, certainly. I would have, put, I would have had a page with other issues, uh, at least just put up there. But I didn't uh, you know, have the time to do that. So I have one question. Uh, do you think that you could find a sentence uh, independent of ZFC, a concrete sentence, where even you cannot know whether the sentence is, is uh, true. So that's something like that. If, right, it is, it, if it is true, then it is, then it is. You want, a, you want a symmetric one, uh, it's sort yeah. of like uh, arithmetical yeah. splitting talk or, or, exactly. or, or, or one that, the, or one that I, I mean, for instance, the technique I need to show that this sentence is consistent, assuming that this works, is, is, is the fact that it follows from a large cardinal, right? So you want to avoid that. Yeah, this is, um, I mean, let me be careful. You asked me whether I could do that. I'm not sure. I can't do it now. Um, I'm ambivalent about, I mean, I, I think this is an important issue. It, I think if that one was the easier one, we, we would be saying, can you find one that you can settle with, with, with with well-known additional axioms that you can't settle? Otherwise, everybody would say, that's what we should do, right? In other words, if, if I had to be in a world where this is the one that can be controlled and not, and not the one that you've asked versus the world in which this one you asked could be controlled and that one we don't know how to do, I'd rather be in this world. Okay. So, let's think. Well, got another question. Hello. So I just w wanted to ask about this uh, measure of uh, naturalness. So uh, you said that uh, uh, you are looking or you are hoping to get uh, sentences which have really a very short description in terms of bits. So if you take uh, ZFC and you just apply uh, a diagonalization, then uh, you, you, you get a sentence whose length is at least the, the bit length of the description of, of the axiom that you use. So do, do you hope to, to get something below that? Of course, the, there is always some kind of overhead, so, but if you ignore this, then... Okay, something. well, for example, the continuum policies, in a language that has real numbers, bijections, etc., the continuum policy is extremely tiny compared to anything like that. And also, you can't just do it, it isn't just going to be the bit length of, of the axes of ZFC as schemes. You're going to have some infrastructure costs. Right, which is which is actually s somewhat nasty. So you're going to have some infrastructure costs plus the plus the axioms, not just the axioms. And obviously, if you just take as an experiment the continuum policies, and you have an ob the obvious uh, 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 baby language that you can get certified by the uh, World Congress, uh, you would uh, have uh, something incredibly smaller than that. So that's what I'm trying to, trying to say. Does okay. that answer? Yes, okay. In the end, you mentioned the const uh, in the last sentence, construction of the language is based on exceedingly common mathematical notions. So do you think that category theory provides an example of such a language? You know, for example, you know, the notion of subjective, injective, is a very simple notion in category theory, but uh, it is used all over. Well, the, I, I mean, I can throw this question back to you. Does it, uh, is, isn't this, um, what purpose you want to ser use for this, could it be also served in set theory with the same size? Um, well, um, well. I mean, I think that this is part of a, very, a really interesting question now that I think about it. There's category, categorical organization of math and there's set theoretic foundations. Um, you're not, nobody's gonna get me easily to say that the categorical approach is, uh, serves as foundations, but it does serve as organization. Okay. Uh, now, you can ask this question, whether if given a sentence which makes some sense on both sides, when is it true or not true that on one side it's much more complicated than the other side? I think that's a, a pretty interesting question. 
Uh, and then also, so does that help? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the visit. Okay.